Good morning. Welcome back to our online study of the Gospel of John. It's a beautiful day here in Northern California. Uh, the smoke is hardly noticeable at all, and that's a, a vast improvement over the last couple of weeks. I hope that means that the firefighters are getting a handle on at least uh, the local fires in the region, but uh, it's good to see the, a blue sky. I hope it's a great day wherever you're at, and we do continue to pray for the firefighters. Uh, a lot of fires going on on the West Coast, and of course you got the, the rain and the, the hurricanes on the East Coast, so a lot going on, but I pray it's a good day wherever you're at, and I'm again, I'm grateful for you uh, clicking on the video and, and studying along with us. We are, of course, in the Gospel of John, and we've made our way to chapter 10, verses 22 through 42 today. We're rapidly coming to uh, a decisive point in the Gospel of John. Uh, we're nearing the halfway point, but as I've mentioned before, really the last half of the Gospel of John kind of focuses on just the last little time in Jesus' earthly ministry. If you've been studying with us, you've known that uh, throughout these early chapters in John's record of Jesus' ministry, You've got uh, Jesus, at least in bits and pieces, revealing who he is and kind of more of that as it goes along. And due to that fact, the opposition has, rose, uh, has risen up against Jesus. And um, he's had some threats on his life already, and that's going to happen again today before we're done. So anyway, please get your Bibles or your electronic devices and bring up John chapter 10. And I encourage you to read along as we go through these verses. John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Let me just read that text and then we'll talk about it some. It says, At that time the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken... Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. So again, as you see, there are things heating up, and the claims of Jesus are causing these sparks with the, the Jewish leadership. Let's talk about the setting. It was mentioned right there at the beginning in verses 22 and 23. It mentions the Feast of Dedication. The Feast of Dedication was not a divinely appointed feast in the sense that God in the Law of Moses didn't say this is a feast I'm setting aside for you, my people, to, to follow. But it was a feast that rose up by tradition among the Jews. It was commemorative of the victory of the Jews over the Syrians approximately 200 years before the time of Christ. If you know your Bible history in that time between the Old and New Testament, uh, Judas Maccabeus rose up and the Jews for a time at least asserted their, their autonomy. They defeated the Syrians and uh, again for a brief time 
they weren't under any foreign oppression, but this feast was uh, meant to commemorate that event. It took place in what would be the latter part of December by our modern calendar. In fact, you note there in the text, it says in verse 23, it was winter. Uh, the modern Jewish celebration of Hanukkah, celebrated on December 25th, is an outgrowth of the Feast of Dedication. This was a feast in which the messianic expectations were usually high. Again, that probably feeds off the Maccabean time when, you know, they thought, oh, this is going to be the, the resurrection of the glorious days of David. Again, it was short-lived, but uh, perhaps that fed the messianic expectations. So this was a time, even the time of Jesus, when they were looking for that. It mentions also in the beginning two verses there, the portico of Solomon. That was a covered structure in the temple area, which would have provided shelter from the weather during that part of the year. So that's where we're at. That's the setting. More importantly, though, we're going to discover that the weather was not the only thing that was likely cool at that particular time. Even more Deadly for Jesus would be the cold iciness that had gripped the hearts of the Jewish leaders, and it led to another interesting exchange between Jesus and these leaders. The discussion begins with a request in verse 24. John 10, verse 24. It says, The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ or the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus, of course, had been revealing his identity by both word and action up to this point, but many of his listeners, especially among the leadership, were not paying attention. We've seen that in the past few chapters over and over again. Uh, they, they ask Jesus questions, and Jesus gives them answers, but it's not enough, and, and they keep hounding him, so they're doing that here. Jesus is going to go on here in this text to highlight this disconnect you know, Jesus, in word and action, has been revealing who he was, but they're, uh, they're not paying attention. This disconnect is seen in Jesus' reply in verses 25 through 30. John 10, 30, 25, rather, through, through 30. Let me read those verses again. It says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify, or bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, if you were with us last week for the early verses in John chapter 10, these verses echo uh, that imagery Jesus brought up there of the, of the Good Shepherd and the sheep and the sheepfold and the door of all of that. So he's building upon that discussion as well. But according to Jesus here, we saw it there in verse 25, the problem wasn't a lack of information. You know, they start out by asking Jesus, why, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Uh, Jesus says, I've been doing that. Again, it wasn't a lack of information. He had been telling and showing them. You want to just jot down a few verses uh, over the last several chapters, Jesus has been revealing in word and deed who he was. We saw it in chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, and verse 37. Then again in chapter 6, Jesus says something about himself and who he was. John 6, verse 39, verse 41, and verses 57 and 58. Then in chapter 7, Verse 17, verses 28 and 29, and verse 33, and, verse, and then chapter 8, rather, verses 16 through 18, verse 23, 42, and 58. You can pause the video and go back and look at all of those verses on your own. We won't take time to read them right now, but those are all times when Jesus revealed in words who he was and what he had come to do. Then, of course, you've got his words, or, or his, rather his actions, or his, his works. What have we seen? Chapter 2, the miraculous turning of water to wine. Chapter 4, the healing of the nobleman's son. Chapter 5, the healing of the lame man. Chapter 6, the feeding of the great multitude. And then in chapter 9, the last chapter, we saw the healing of the blind man. 
So in both cases, both by word and deed, Jesus has given them plenty of information about his claims. The problem here is their unwillingness to accept what they had been told and what they had seen. That's the real issue here. This unwillingness on the part of these listeners proved that they were not part of Jesus' flock. Did you catch that there in verses 26 and 7? 27 says, You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. There are those who hear Jesus and those who won't. What are the characteristics of the Lord's sheep? They hear and they follow. And that's an identification factor of if you're part of, of the flock of Jesus, you hear the shepherd, and when you do that, you follow or obey. These people, though, were missing out on the benefits of being part of the Lord's flock. Did you catch that in verses 28 and 29? You could back up even to verse 27. One of the benefits of being part of the flock of Jesus was being known by Jesus. It says there, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. We already talked about hearing and following as, I, as markers of the sheep of Jesus. But here Jesus says, I know my sheep. That's a benefit of being part of the flock of Jesus. A couple more in verses 28 and 29 as far as benefits of being part of the, the flock of the Lord is eternal life and security. There in verse 28, he says, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And he goes on to talk about no one being able to snatch them out of my hand. Uh, my father has given them to me and he is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So that's the security here of, of this flock. These are all benefits that come by being part of the flock of Jesus. But Jesus says by your continual unwillingness to listen and to, to follow, that shows you know you're not one of my sheep. They refused to uh, the relationship of the Father to the Son. And this is really the... the uh, the sticking point for these listeners in verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. As we're going to see, this is a, this is a, a, a claim that uh, is going to set them off. We see that these words of Jesus here, especially this last sentence, elicit a strong reaction in verses 31 through 33. If you know your Bible history, you understand why uh, what Jesus says here. Uh, sets them off. Verse 31, at this final statement of Jesus, I and the Father are one, says the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Again, Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you make your you being a man make yourself out to be God. Now that's instructive. Their reaction tells us some things about that statement of Jesus. The last statement of the Lord regarding his unity with the Father causes these Jews once again to reach for rocks. We saw it back in chapter, the end of chapter eight, didn't we? John eight verses fifty eight and fifty nine. There was, you know, Jesus said something there pretty clearly that causes them to say, well, it's time for stoning. It happens again here. Jesus tries to get them to think about what they're doing, doesn't he? There in verse 32, he said, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? You know, it's, it's you, you can't please these people, can you? They started out this whole discussion by saying, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Um, how long are you going to keep us in this suspense? And Jesus, every time, you know, it's Jesus says, he tells them again and, and they get angry. So in essence, they're really not wanting to know. They're not hearing what they want to hear. Here, Jesus says, your actions are illogical. All they have in mind here, based on the statement of Jesus, when he says, I and the Father are one, all they have in mind is a perceived blasphemy on the part of Jesus. The word blasphemy in the Bible means to speak against. And they're saying Jesus' claim, when he says, I and the Father are one, is, is a, speaking against God himself. In fact, you know, and you know, we know what 
they probably had in mind. You know, they were the Jews remembered what God said about his name, and you had to be careful what you said about God and how you treated his name. Clear back is part of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. God himself said, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So you have it right there in, in the primary commandments. Then in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, we learn, it says, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So there's a reason why they're reaching for rocks here. In their minds, Jesus is, in essence, claiming to be God, claiming to have a, this relationship with God that they're not going to tolerate. That's, that's you know, wrong to them. So that's, their, that's why they're reacting as they do. For anyone else to say what Jesus said would violate the law. The only problem is that Jesus could legitimately make the claim. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he's making a legitimate claim. He's not speaking against God. He's speaking the truth. But the Jews don't see it that way. Just as a side note here, I would remind everyone that you know, there are some who claim, and even some religious people in our world, that Jesus never claimed to be divine. You know, Jesus, they, they make a point, well, you know, it's Christians that say Jesus claimed to be God and have that type of relationship, but Jesus himself never really made those claims. Well, these Jews who knew the law likely better than you and I certainly make the connection, don't they? You know, they, what do they say there? Based upon that statement, says the Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. They heard clearly what Jesus said. And I find it instructive as well that Jesus doesn't backtrack at all, does he? You know, if if Jesus wasn't making the claim that people say he didn't, didn't make, this would have been a, a great time for Jesus saying, now, Hold on here. I didn't say what you think I said. You know, they, they say, well, you, you make yourself out to be God. Jesus could have squashed that in, a, in an instant by saying, nope, you're misunderstanding me. But he doesn't. He doesn't backtrack because he is claiming what they understood him to claim. In fact, he goes on to offer re, a rebuttal to their reaction. Verses 34 through 39. John 10, verses 34 through 39. Here's Jesus' defense. It says, Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you believe me, believe the work, though you do not believe me, rather, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Now there's again that, that claim. It's parallel to when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He says it again here in just different words. The Father is in me, and I in the Father. And once again, notice the reaction, verse 39. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him. He eluded their grasp. So what Jesus is doing here, first of all, he argues from their own scriptures. Uh, the quote there in verse uh, 34, when it says, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? That comes from Psalm 82, verse 6. But Jesus argues from, you know, their scriptures. He says that there are other divine beings who share a relationship with God. There in verse 34 through 36, that's Jesus' point. He says your own scriptures talk about divine beings. God's divine counsel, if you will, heavenly beings that uh, you know are at God's beck and call. So for Jesus to make an even greater claim here, as he does, when he says, I and the Father are one, shouldn't be automatically rejected as blasphemy. There are other sons of God in that sense of the term, not to the level of Jesus, but he starts off by saying, you know what, yeah, your own uh, scriptures reveals this, so you shouldn't have a problem with me. 
Then he goes on to say, my works back up my claim. At least believe them. You know, if you don't believe my words, look at what I'm doing. And that should point out that, you know, I'm more than a man. At least believe them. As we see in verse 39, their stubbornness, of course, was blinding them, right? They were seeking again to seize him. And he eluded their grasp. Thankfully, though, there were other more positive responses. And that's what we end the chapter with in verses 40 through 42. Let me read those verses again. It says, he went away. Again, Jesus eludes their grasp. He eludes their attempt on his life to stone him to death. It says, he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was for baptizing, baptizing, and he stayed there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. So what we see there basically is that even though these Jews, likely the, the leadership among the Jews, was stubbornly refusing to accept the words and the actions of Jesus, there were some who were getting it. And most likely those who, you know, again, Jesus is interested in calling his sheep. And who are the sheep of God? Those who hear the Son and follow the Son and enjoy the benefits because of that. How tragic it was for these Jews here in John chapter 10 and the earlier chapters well to continue to stubbornly refuse to accept Jesus for who he was given the evidence he provided. I have to you know, ask the question, what more could Jesus have said than what he's already said up to this point? He's, he's you know, said it you know, in dozens of different ways and it doesn't matter. What more could Jesus have said? And nothing, really. They, what more could Jesus have done? He's performed some great miracles up to this point that identify and back up his claims. What more could he have done? The answer to both of these questions, what could more could he have said? What more could he have done? Is nothing. Because the minds of these listeners in the early part of our text was already made up. See, the, you know, their question there at the start, if you are the Christ, why are you keeping us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus has told them plainly, but they're unwilling to hear. I would also affirm, though, that it's just as tragic for anyone today to continue to refuse to accept Jesus with the same evidence, and even more. You see, we have even more evidence for the claims of Jesus than these folks had, but yet there are still some Today, who refuse to accept Jesus. The claims are clear. They are controversial, yes, but that doesn't change the claim. If you are in that camp, if you're refusing to accept the reality about Jesus, you're forfeiting the same things that these Jews were forfeiting, according to Jesus. Remember the benefits we talked about in this section? If uh, you know, the benefits of accepting Jesus as who he was, as the good shepherd, are being known by God, having eternal life, and enjoying the security found only in God and his Son. You can't get those benefits anywhere else. But you're forfeiting them if you refuse to accept Jesus. And I would ask, is it worth trading all these privileges for the dubious honor of clinging to unbelief. These Jews here are just clinging stubbornly to what they've always been told, but yet they were misguided. When faced with clear evidence, they're still unwilling to believe. And if that's your place, I pray that you'll reconsider, that you'll think carefully about the claims of Jesus and, and come to understand them for what they really are. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was the one sanctified by God, set apart for a, an earthly mission to come and uh, be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. He came and he did that. And what's left, of course, is for you or I or in, in the, the whole world to either accept or reject those claims. And it's my prayer that uh, you will not stubbornly refuse to accept Jesus.
consider these things. Thank you for studying along with me. If you've got some questions or comments, I'll leave a comment below in the, the, this video in the section. You can do that and I'll respond and we can talk more about that. But uh, I do pray that your week goes well. Again, I hope it's a great day wherever you are. It's always a great day in the Lord, regardless of the weather or the disasters or anything else going on. And uh, we're thankful for God's love and, and provision through Jesus. God bless and have a great day.